All right, today we're going to be talking about the first people to arrive in Texas. Uh, we're going to be talking about these American Indians. I use the term American Indians because it's preferred by most federally recognized Native American tribes. You might hear Native American as well. Uh, and that generally, academics use the term Indian over Native American. But we're going to be discussing how these first people, these first Texans, came to Texas, what they did when they got here, and how things are going to change from first arrival about 15,000 years ago or so to about 2000 BC. Okay, well, who were these first Texans? And we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about American Indians in Texas. One of the reasons for that is that I think they're pretty important, and I also think there's a lot of misunderstandings about American Indians. So if you were to ask most Texans, most people in the United States, what do you think of when you think of Indians? Most people are going to get an impression that Indians were something like this. You know, people riding horseback, living off the land, nomadic, moving from one place to another, maybe living in a teepee. Now, you know, if you ask somebody older, somebody that grew up on movies in the 50s or 60s, something like that, their impression of American Indians might be savages, might be more bloodthirsty, something like that. If you ask somebody... You know, who grew up in the 70s, 80s, or 90s, they might have the more dances with wolves uh, view of American Indians. But consistently, it's no matter if it's 50s, 60s, or 70s, 80s, 90s, you're going to get this impression that American Indians were sort of this uncivilized group that was, you know, again, uh, constantly moving from one place to another, teepees, things like that. Absolutely, this is true that there were some American Indians here when Europeans arrived that lived like the people you see here in this picture. But and, and by the way, a lot of these people in Texas when Europeans arrive are going to be nomadic hunter-gatherers. None, however, are going to have the horse. That's going to be something we're going to talk about later. But the thing is, in the United States and in Texas, there were other American Indians they were nothing like this, okay? This is just one culture of American Indians. Just like Europe, just like Africa, just like Asia, you go from one place to another, and you're going to see entirely different language, entirely different foods eating, entirely different way of living, entirely uh, different styles of homes. When people talk American Indians, we generally have this consistent view that American Indians shared religion, uh, shared a culture. That is absolutely 100% not true. It's one of the things that bothers me uh, when people talk about American Indians. There's no consistent culture for American Indians, okay? And the same thing goes with Texas. We're going to have some American Indians in Texas that were hunter-gatherers, that lived in TP, that sort of fit the stereotype that everybody's uh, seen from movies of American Indians. You know, uh, some groups live like this. But we're also going to have American Indians in Texas that live like this, that live, were sedentary, they were agriculturalist, they got most of their calories from uh, plant products or, or uh, uh, you know, raising some domesticated animals, uh, just like we do today. They born in a place, they live that place their entire life, they die in that place, they're not going around, you know, uh, moving from one place to another, they're not, you know, the Indians you see in, in movies. And we have other groups that live something like this. Again, sedentary, uh, build monumental architecture like the mounds you see in this picture. Again, not hunter-gatherers. Okay, So that's one of the reasons that I want to talk about American Indians at length. Another reason I want to talk about American Indians at length is because a lot of our words and place names, and places, by the way, come from American Indians. All right? So... Uh, here in Texas, pre we speak primarily English and Spanish, okay? Latin based is, is for Spanish, uh, English, a little bit of Latin, and some uh, Anglo-Saxon in there as well. Well, we also, within both of those languages, have incorporated American Indian words. So, you know, when Europeans come over, they don't have words for certain items. Things like pecans, okay? Uh, things like hickory, things like mesquite. They aren't in the old world. They're here in the new world. When they come here, American Indians say, okay, well, this is a mesquite tree. Okay, this is a, uh, I'm going to call this mesquite. So certain words in our languages uh, are American Indian in origin. Place names, a lot of our place names are American Indian in origin. So Europeans come along, they find a river for the first time. They're going to uh, see what's the name of this. Sometimes they'll name it 
you know, oh, this is a big river. So we got Rio Grande is a, a big river, essentially. But other times they're going to name things after what the American Indians say or the American Indian tribe that's closest to the river. And if you look around Texas, we have a lot of place names like Wichita Falls. Wichita Falls was named after the Wichita Indians uh, that lived in the area. Comanche Peak, that was uh, named after the Comanches that lived in the area of Comanche, Comanche Peak, obviously. So we have a lot of place names uh, coming from American Indians. Uh, we also have a lot of places coming from American Indians. So uh, here in Texas, we have a lot of big cities. Um, Dallas, Houston, you can throw those out, Austin as well. But it's some of our other bigger cities, you know, El Paso uh, in San Antonio, those are directly related to American Indians. The first people to settle in those region were American Indians, and later on, uh, the Spanish are going to come along. They have this idea to convert Indians into Spaniards, teach them Catholicism. In order to do that, they build these mission complexes, basically these church uh, walled structures, and they start teaching Indians Christianity. The city then grows from there. You have maybe some settlers uh, start living beside the missions. Then you have some soldiers to protect the people there. Next thing you know, you have a city. Next thing you know, uh, Americans come in. They start settling there. And then you start seeing more and more businesses come along. Pretty soon, in the case of San Antonio, you have a population of, I don't know what it is today, million and a half, something like that. Probably, probably more than that, El Paso. 700,000 or whatever. Those two places began as missions. Another uh, big city that began as uh, uh, something to do with Indians, Fort Worth. Okay, We did have some of those nomadic hunter-gatherer Indians you see in the movies. Some of those were hostile uh, to settlers. So in order, order to protect settlers, uh, you're going to have the American government build a series of forts to protect against Indians. Well, People start uh, living by the fort because it's the safest place. Then you get more settlers coming in, and you pretty soon you've got a city by the fort, Fort Worth, that is of American Indian origin. You go out here to East Texas, you've got Nacogdoches. Nacogdoches used to be an Indian city, okay? Uh, again, something we're going to be talking about is that you used to have these permanent settlements of Indians in Texas, these cattle people we're going to get into in a little bit here. They used to live in cities of thousands of people, well, you know, they lived in Nacogdoches is where one group of caddos lived, cleared out forests, plowed fields there. Uh, they're going to eventually move or be forced out. We'll talk about that later. Um, well, you know, Americans come in, uh, actually uh, first uh, the Spanish come in, and they see this place, hey, look, the forest is cleared here, the fields are plowed, um, this would be a great place to live not realizing that just a little bit before that you, you had an American Indian group living there. So we have places that are of American Indian origin, okay? Another reason we're going to talk a lot about American Indians is that people think of American Indians as gone, like as they're not around anymore. Uh, that's not true. We obviously have a lot of people uh, of American Indian origin. A lot of people up here in Oklahoma uh, used to live in Texas or, or American Indian origin, so a lot of us, uh, you know, have ancestry uh, tied to American Indians. If you're Mexican American and your family has long ties uh, to Texas, there's a very good chance you have American Indian uh, ancestry. Uh, probably from uh, if you've been here long enough, uh, Texas from Texas Indians. Um, so people have American Indian ancestry. All right, so it's not like they're gone. And we do have three uh, American Indian reservations here in Texas. So. Again, it's not like they uh, just all of a sudden disappeared. Still around, and it's important to talk about them. Uh, final thing, I want to talk about American Indians. We have this impression here in the United States, and I think this is sort of counter-narrative we developed to the Indians as savages in the movies in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. The Indians were environmentalists. Well, that's not true. Um, just like everybody else, American Indians are people who want to meet their basic needs, one of the ways you can do this is by tailoring your environment to uh, best suit your needs. And so American Indians would do things like uh, burn forests for cropland. We see that here in the east. And you would see here in the plains, we're going to talk about these hunter-gatherer groups. One of the ways that they would uh, encourage buffalo is to burn down the grasses seasonally. So every year you start fires intentionally. It burns down. 
stuff that you don't want there in the plains. It, the buffalo, you know, impedes the buffalo growth like trees. Uh, buffalo can't move around as easily in trees. They can't eat, you know, tree trunks, but they can eat uh, small baby grass, essentially. Young grass, you burn down the old grass and you get this uh, new grass that um, uh, the buffalo like to eat. That's going to mean the buffalo will get strong, big, fat, and then you eat the buffalo. So some people argue, and this is going to be something we're going to be talking about, that we had so much seasonal burning here that it actually transformed the environment of the plains. Okay, So they, in a way, may have shaped what Texas looks like uh, uh, geographically, environmentally. Okay, All right, so we are going to talk a lot about American Indians uh, during this class, but we're not going to talk about them as much as we will Europeans and Americans, all right? Um, why is that? Well, it seems like you should be spending 95% of the time talking about American Indians. First American Indians get to Texas about 15,000 years ago, and we don't see you know, uh, Europeans arrive, or at least permanently, until the 1700s. Why would we spend, you know, let's say, Nine tenths of the class, well, a little bit even longer than that, and say uh, uh, 19 twentieths of the class after 1492 or after 1700, um, when we're not getting nearly as much time from the first 15,000 years of human habitation. Why don't we get from 15,000 to 1492? Why isn't that the bulk of the class? Well, one of the reasons is there is going to be probably more impact uh, on our day-to-day -day lives today from Spanish, Mexican, and uh, Americans than there is American Indians. This is Texas history. That's a fact. Again, American Indians affect us, but probably not as much as those other groups. Other thing is that we simply don't know as much about Texas and the people living in it before 1492. American Indians developed writing system down in Mesoamerica but no American Indians in Texas had um, a writing system. So this means we have to rely on different sources to sort of construct the narrative before 1492, before the arrival of Europeans, okay? So how have we constructed this narrative? Well, one thing we can do is archaeologists. So archaeologists will go to places like West Texas. We have uh, uh, Indian civilizations that have lived here in West Texas, uh, have left their mark in a number of different ways. Uh, one of the ways they've left their mark is they have these, you know, cave paintings or these paintings that you'll find on rock cliffs, and a lot of these have been preserved until today. Well, cave paintings are not and petroglyphs, as you'll sometimes hear them called, are not writing. Okay, basically these are up to artistic interpretation. So if you're looking at a cave painting, and you look at this cave painting. You ask one person, you know, what do you see here? And they might describe something very different from, you know, the next person. Even back at the time it was painted, that would be the case. So let's say this artist painted this. We come along and we look at it. One person might say that this little guy down here, this represents a snake. So this must be depicting a snake hunt or something like that. Next person might look at this and say, oh, well, no, this is depicting a river. So right now, we've already, first thing we've looked at, we might have some fusion. Okay, up here, you know, what is this stuff up there? One person might say, oh, those hills, so this is indicating a, a, you know, a snake hunt that happened in some hills up here uh, uh, in this hilly area. Another person might, might say, well, no, look, that's just clouds, all right? Well, what are these guys over here? One person might look at that and say, well, these are... Uh, shield, so this must be a battle or um, you know a party that's going out to um, uh, to fight an enemy. Another person might look at that and say, no, these are shamans. This is a costume they wore for a rain ceremony. So right now we have multiple different interpretations of what this meant. You ask the guy from Ancient Aliens, who are these guys? He's going to of course say aliens because that's what he says for everything. So we have a bunch of different interpretations. Thing is, with writing, uh, with written language, which again, American Indians had in Mesoamerica, but they didn't have in Texas, there's interpretation, but not nearly as much interpretation as petroglyphs. So if you have something written in a language, you can take this book, you know, scroll, whatever, 
go 200 miles down the road, show the person, another person who can read that language, the scroll, they're going to read things the same as the other person, okay? Languages are consistent. They have, you know, uh, the same meaning from one place to another, from one time to another. That's not the case with petroglyphs. There's no set standard for what each symbol means. So again, um, to one person, this symbol means shaman. To another person, this symbol means warrior. To ancient aliens guide, this symbol means aliens. Okay, so we can't learn a lot uh, about uh, from from just these cave paintings, we can learn stuff from archaeology. Okay, so archaeologists go out to West Texas. They um, you see here they're looking at cave paintings, probably also doing a, a dig. So what they will do is they'll they'll find a site that there's evidence of human habitation, start digging things up. What they're going to find a lot of times is essentially trash pits. This is where you learn a lot about ancient societies. You know, find things like bones that can tell you what people ate. You can find uh, arrow tips, you know, that'll tell you how people hunted. You can find uh, bones of humans, you know, if they have indications of, um, you know, uh, being struck with arrows. Well, it's obvious these guys got in a fight with somebody else. So you can tell things like that. You can find pottery. Uh, you can find, um, you can test bones and, and uh, uh, fragments uh, of skeletons to see what people ate. So you can learn, uh, you know, if people were agricultural or if they are primary hunter-gatherer. So we can learn a lot through archaeology. Fortunately, you can't learn narrative history. You can't learn this happened, then this happened, this happened. You can learn general cultural stuff, but you can't learn day-to-day -day things uh, from archaeology alone. Well, there are ways to supplement archaeology. One thing you can do is you could... Uh, uh, you could uh, get oral histories from American Indians. So say you had uh, American Indian group here that lived here 1492, you know, consistently lived in this area for a long time. Today you have ancestors of these people living up here in Oklahoma. You could go uh, to the ancestors and you can say, what was your way of life, you know, way back when, before uh, uh, written records started coming along? Well, someone might tell you a very accurate depiction of events, okay? Oral history passed down from one generation to another generation. Very well might be accurate, and there is some value in getting modern uh, oral histories. But there also is a lot of cases where there's games of telephone, okay? So remember when I was five years old, we had this little game where we were in kindergarten. The teacher uh, started out by whispering to one kid, Super Bowl, okay? Well... First kid whispers Super Bowl, the next kid, next kid hears Salad Bowl, next here kid, kid hears, uh, uh, let's say, Cobb Salad, the next here kid hears Tie Cobb, the next here kid hears uh, Tie Your Shoes. By the end of it, we've got Air Jordans or whatever as the uh, uh, the final thing that, that we're learning about, or the, the telephone game. Well, that happens with American Indians, okay? So the oral history might start as one thing, and a lot of times, again, by the time it gets to the end, it could be very close, but other times it could be a big, gross distortion of uh, what was originally uh, you know, taught about the, these old societies. So you can use those a little bit, but again, there are going to be some inaccuracies. Other ways we can learn about uh, pre-1492 history is we can go back to the early written records. So Europeans are going to come along, and we'll talk about this shortly, in the 1500s. When they come along, uh, they're going to start writing down what they uh, see, what you know the people tell them, and you know we can look at these records. That gets us a little bit closer to you know uh, 1492 and before. You know, find a record from say 1536 when uh, the first Europeans arrived in Texas. Okay, so that's going to be good. We we can find some value there. But unfortunately, those two, uh, those sources are also going to have uh, problems. So, for example, if you, one of those problems is bias and talking about the things that are unfamiliar rather than things that are familiar. And the example I always like to use is, um, imagine you are going to Paris for the first time. You walk into a McDonald's. The McDonald's is exactly the same as McDonald's you would see here in Texas. Uh, it's got, you know, um, uh, cheeseburgers, french fries, everything is exactly the same, except they have a snail burger, okay? They have a snail burger, 
um, you know, 20 snails on a bun or whatever. But otherwise, everything else is the same. You get out there, you get on Instagram, you write about something about the, the Paris uh, McDonald's. You're probably not going to write, and they have ketchup just like ours. You're probably not going to write, uh, you know, man, the fries taste exactly the same. You're going to write, holy heck, they've got this snail burger. You know, that's what you're going to tell people about. Well, we're going to see that with our first explorers here in Texas, first European explorers. They're not going to write about the things that they have in common with the uh, people of Texas. They're going to write about the snail burgers. Hey, this is weird. Look what this guy's up to. This guy does this. Uh, this group over here does this. It, isn't it so strange? So we have problems there. So what I'm bringing this all up to, to talk about, uh, to just bring up the fact that when we talk about American Indians, especially before 1492, uh, there is going to be some issues. We might not things have, have things 100% right, but I, I think for the most part, we have a good idea by, by combining these different sources um, together. All right. So uh, ha- now that we've got that out of the way, we need to talk about how the first people get to Texas. In order to do that, we need to look at just general world history. I think I mentioned this before, but you know, Earth's 4.5 billion years old. Uh, a long time ago, it used to be this huge uh, uh, Pangea where we had both continents were together. Eventually, due to science stuff, uh, tectonic plates, things like that, uh, we've separated into this eastern hemisphere over here. Western Hemisphere over here. You know, we had similar species that would, would uh, you know, uh, cross over when Pangea was together. Uh, you know, evolution is going to separate uh, species a little bit. Uh, but for the most part, uh, you know, uh, these, these two guys separate uh, millions of years ago. Well, about 200,000 years ago, we started to see this distinct species emerge here in Central Africa, okay? This is going to be early modern humans, all right? So about 200,000 years ago, we had these primate species uh, that walks on, you know, a walk on two feet, opposable thumbs, start to differentiate itself from other animals. And this includes other, you know, uh, humanoid species. We had things like Neanderthals running around out there, um, these smaller creatures, you know, that are humanoid creatures in uh, uh, New Zealand, these uh, people call them hobbits, uh, things like that. We had other humanoids, but humans were different from even these other humanoids. What they would do is um, things that other animals don't do. They would do things like make tools. You might see you know, sea otters use a rock to smash open an oyster, but you don't see them you know, do something complex like use a hammer to uh, uh, you know, hammer a nail in or anything like that, or hammer a piece of wood into another piece of wood to secure them together. We don't see these other animals making music and making the sort of level of music humans start to do. So humans 200,000 years ago start doing that, start, you know, making fishing hooks, catch fish fish better, start producing art, you know, start painting their hands on the walls, uh, start burying their dead. That's going to be something that sets uh, these uh, humans away from uh, other animals. Uh, other things humans start to do is um, they start to talk. They have these vocal cords that can form uh, words. Now, other animals like you know, dogs can bark simple messages. Bark, hey, there's food down here. Bark, watch out, there's danger over here. Humans can say, hey, Bob, go two miles up, take a right on Sycamore Street, go to the left. Uh, there's a Taco Bell up there. We can communicate complex ideas other animals can't. You know, why this happens, why humans start setting themselves apart from other animals, a million different reasons for it, but uh, just know that about 100,000 years ago, we have these distinct creatures that are very different from other creatures. Well, sometime from 100,000 years ago to 75,000 years ago, anthropologists are constantly changing their estimates about you know, when humans first left Africa, things like that. So if you hear a different number somewhere else, uh, then you know, just know they're con- blame archaeolo- or, um, anthropologists. They're constantly changing their numbers. But about 100,000 years ago to 75,000 years ago, we start seeing some of these humans start leaving uh, Africa and start moving around this uh, Eurasia. We're going to have some start going down here, expanding into New Zealand, expanding into Australia. Others are going to go here, start expanding into Europe. 
Uh, when they go out there, by the way, they're going to start killing off the other humanoids that had left Afri Africa before. Uh, so bye-bye Neanderthals, bye-bye uh, hobbits in, in New, New, uh, uh, New Guinea. Um, so uh, we see these humans start to uh, expand out. And as they expand out, we start to see some genetic differences. So people start adapting to their environment. You'll see people in more northern areas uh, developing lighter skin because sunshine is less frequent and you need more vitamin D. Uh, people in higher elevations will have uh, you know, uh, uh, greater lung capacity to get more oxygen in the air. Nothing major, but just minor genetic differentiations from one group of people uh, to another. So about you know, 75,000 years ago, this process begins. By 32,000 years ago, humans have pretty much expanded all throughout uh, the Eastern Hemisphere. We get our first humans actually up here in what's today, Eastern Siberia, about 32,000 years ago. The particular group of humans uh, that we get, uh, this would be some ancient, ancient humans here, the particular group that we're gonna be talking about in the uh, ancestors to the first people in the Americas, the first American Indians. Uh, this particular group has uh, long black hair, uh, generally faces that have little facial hair, um, uh, and, and that's going to be some of their distinct, distinguishing characteristics. So they arrive out here in, in eastern Siberia about 32,000 years ago, and I should point out at this point, humans all throughout uh, the eastern hemisphere pretty much the same techno technology wise. Nobody is developing, has developed agriculture. Nobody has uh, domesticated animals outside of dogs. Everybody's hunter gatherers moving one place to another, uh, searching for animal protein, you know, following game herds, uh, maybe getting some uh, berries, fruits, things like that that they find in nature. Nobody is advanced like we're about to see, okay? so. Humans all over the place, relatively same. The particular group here uh, in eastern Siberia, uh, the same technology-wise as everybody else. Well, these humans get out here, and about 32,000 years ago, uh, eastern Siberia was different than it is in present day. So present day, you can't walk between what's today Russia and uh, Alaska. It's, there's water in this area. Well, about 32,000 years ago, the Earth was going through something called the Ice Age for science reasons that I'm not going to explain. Uh, and basically just know that the Earth was pretty much substantially cooler than it is uh, today. Being colder means that more ice, uh, more water is going to be trapped in the polar ice cap. So colder, you know, um, ocean freezes more. Uh, that means that more water trapped in the ice caps, which means less water is in the oceans. So what this means is that about 32,000 years ago, this area between Alaska and Russia, the sea levels are lower, and it was low enough to where there was this sort of land area in, in between Alaska and Russia in a place that uh, uh, historians have come to call Beringia, okay? This, it's not a bridge, it's this whole area of Beringia. So these humans move out here about 32,000 years ago. They're following these game herds. They get into what's today Alaska, and they sort of stop right there. Okay, so one of the other effects of the Ice Age is that uh, North America was substantially colder than it, it, it was uh, today, and Canada actually used to be covered in glaciers. So you go out here to Canada, uh, you know, today there's a couple glaciers still around. It's still obviously very cold in Canada, but back then it was even colder. It was so cold that during the summers, ice wouldn't melt in a lot of areas. Eventually it gets covered in this just Imagine it, uh, dozens and dozens of feet of ice. So humans get here, and when they find, you know, right at the border of what's today Alaska and Canada, they're going to encounter almost like an ice wall. Uh, think about it if you've seen Game of Thrones, like the ice wall uh, in the northern part of uh, Westeros. So you've got uh, this ice wall. They get here on this ice. No, there's no plants growing because ice is covering everything. Animals aren't growing out there because there's no uh, plants to eat. So humans basically stop. This is just sort of this... Uh, uh, impediment to go any further. So from about 32,000 years ago to about 20,000 years ago, again, dates, you might see uh, different dates uh, from one place to another about uh, when these events happened. But for the most part, 32,000 years ago, about 20,000 years ago, uh, you have uh, humans halt here at the border of uh, Alaska, Canada. 
well, about 20,000 years ago or so, science stuff kicks in and we start to see the Earth warm and we see the end of the Ice Age. Well, what this is going to mean is that we're going to start seeing some of this uh, land along the coast that used to be covered in ice. You know, let's say early humans had, you know, these small boats. They, they couldn't really go around the ice because there's nowhere to stop, you know, to, to make camp or get food because uh, everything's covered in ice. So they're not going to go along the coast here. Well, when things start warming up, we start seeing the coast, you know, the ice goes away from the coast. Now you can start sailing down this coast area. We also see, uh, as ice starts to melt, a corridor open up here in North America. Uh, and this is going to open up essentially this you know, this path through these glaciers that have been covering Canada for these first humans. So about 20,000 years ago, we start seeing humans proceed into North America, okay? Some by uh, the coast, some into the interior uh, of North America. Well, when they get in here, you know, so let's say glaciers covering this area right here, you start proceeding into this interior, a little quarter open, opens up, we start getting around this area. This area has never been covered in glaciers. And so what, when humans first get in there, they're going to find a bunch of animals that have never seen humans before. A lot of this megafauna is, is what we'll call it uh, and what you know, most, most historians call it. These large animals never seen humans before. Now, you know, these animals very similar to animals, or most of them at least, to animals you see in, in the Eastern Hemisphere. But the problem for these animals is they never encountered humans. This advanced species that makes tools, things like that. This is going to be a problem because old world animals were there as humans are starting to become smarter, starting to use more advanced tools, starting to use spears, starting to uh, you know equip stone tips to their spears, and they were able to evolve to avoid these humans. Okay, so today we still have elephants in Africa because. As humans start uh, uh, start using you know spears, start using stone tips on spears, elephants maybe human will go up with their new wooden spear, kill an elephant. Uh, the elephants around them, you know, the ones that are scared of the humans and realize, man, these guys are dangerous. They're going to evolve, or they're going to have uh, kids. They're going to survive, and eventually, the more skittish around human uh, elephants uh, will be the ones that survive, the ones that have kids. And they sort of evolve alongside humans. They learn and adapt to humans as humans are starting to become more advanced technology-wise. Well, you get to this new world, and you have these larger animals, these animals that aren't scared of humans, that are scared in the old world because, again, they, they grew up alongside humans. When the first humans come in, we have an animal like woolly mammoth over here. These woolly mammoth they see no reason to be scared of humans. When the first human comes in, the woolly mammoth is going to see him and say, wow, that's weird. This is a guy walking on two legs. I've never seen anything like that before. There's a couple of them. I'm not scared because I'm a woolly mammoth. I'm a badass. I can kick anything's ass that size. And then woolly mammoth sees, well, what's that guy holding? He's holding a weird, weird little spear thing. I've never seen that before. Oh, crap. The guy threw it at me. This hurts. Oh, what's his buddy over here doing? He's throwing that one at me. Oh, that hurts. I I'm dead. So they are going to start getting killed off very quickly by these humans, and actually even quicker than they can evolve to be skittish around humans. This happens not only with woolly mammoths, but some of these large uh, moose that the humans are going to encounter. If you ever go to the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History in Washington, you'll see uh, a big skeleton of some of these moose, way bigger than the ones we have today. Horses, old road horses, uh, sort of evolved alongside humans. They evolved to be skittish of humans. New World horses, very similar to uh, the ones in the Eastern Hemisphere, they're not going to have that opportunity. So humans are going to come in, start killing off these horses. Uh, horses, again, look at the humans. I'm not scared of this uh, four, four and a half foot creature. Humans used to be a little bit smaller back then. They die. You know, same thing with uh, ox. You know, similar creatures to ox in the, in the New World. They die. And by the way, it's not just them that die. It's also the predators that uh, feed off these animals that are going to die because now the, the animals that they used to hunt, these humans have started to kill off. By the way, there's a couple different interpretations of how these megafauna died. So I'm giving you one interpretation. I think it's the correct interpretation, but there's uh, um, others that you might encounter out there. But I think most people agree nowadays it's, it's humans that, that hunted off this megafauna. 
Uh, and again, once these guys start dying, the predators start dying off. Bye bye saber tooth cat. Bye bye dire wolf. You know, if you ever watch Game of Thrones, there are these huge wolves. Uh, those things used to be really sad. Wolves that were twice the size you see today. So this megafauna, when humans start getting into North America, starts going extinct. Uh, so this would be a picture of humans starting to kill these animals. And, and they start going extinct faster than their population can reproduce uh, because humans by this point are, are, uh, are so well adapted or are so technologically advanced that they uh, uh, can kill these animals quickly. So humans, as they start killing off these large animals, start moving into the interior. It's happening the same on the coast. And about 15,000 years ago, we start seeing these, or before that, 20,000 years ago, we start seeing animals wiped out here. Humans will start moving down here. Oh, the animals aren't wiped out down here. Start moving out down here. They're not wiped out down here. We see this rapid advance of humans starting to kill off this megafauna. Uh, again, not all humans are going to start you know, going down south. We'll see some remaining behind, finding other ways to live. But a good chunk of these first American Indians will move into the interior as the animals die off to find new sources of megafauna. We think this is how the first humans came to Texas. So about 15,000 years ago, we had these humans come down, probably through the Texas panhandle, in search of these uh, megafauna. So back 15,000 years ago, uh, they're going to find new sources of woolly mammoth. And the first actual uh, human uh, evidence of humanity in, in Texas is we have uh, evidence right outside of Austin of a woolly mammoth hunt. We have a woolly mammoth skeleton that has clear indications of um, uh, spear tips. You know, bones are, are uh, uh, dented by the spears or sliced up by the spears. Humans, it looks like it cooked the woolly mammoth. Uh, we also have evidence of a woolly mammoth hunt. Uh, near Louisville, Texas up here. So we know humans were here about 15,000 years ago. Carbon dating tells us when this happened. And these humans come in and start killing off the megafauna. Again, uh, once the megafauna is gone here, some humans are going to start moving south, clearing out the megafauna, North Mexico, then Mexico start moving to South America. But, you know, this is generations and generations, and not all humans are going to proceed south. Some humans that sort of stay behind. And by the way, Humans that moved south about uh, 10,000 years ago, pretty much all the megafauna outside of a handful of giant sloths in, in South America have, have uh, uh, gone extinct uh, by about 10,000 BC. Uh, again, not everybody moved with it. Some people remain behind. So we're going to have some humans here remaining in Texas after you know, megafauna go extinct 15,000, 14,000 BC, whenever they went extinct in Texas. And now the megafauna are gone, these humans are going to have to find new ways uh, to get sustenance, new ways to uh, provide food. You know, what happens when uh, the megafauna are extinct? It used to be easy to get your nutrition. All you had to do was go down and, uh, you know, kill the, the large armadillo. That was another megafauna animal. Uh, you know, the thing that's not scared of you, just stick a spear in it, you got food. Well, now those guys are gone. Um where are we going to find our sustenance? And by, by the way, one other thing uh, about the megafauna, this is going to kind of screw over future generations of American Indians. So in the old world, you know, in the uh, eastern hemisphere, humans back there, uh, the animals evolved alongside them. Well, humans are later going to learn to domesticate animals so they can take the uh, horses that, you know, had evolved to run away from them. They can, you know, breed them to becoming uh, to the point where they'll allow humans to ride them. Um, same thing with cows, basically humans in, in the new world, uh, because again, they involve alongside humans, they're driven to extinction. Humans in the new world won't have these cows to uh, breed to where you can use them for meat or milk. Uh, and this is gonna be a problem for uh, new world people because future generations, again, Europeans will start living by those animals and start having the labor and food from those animals. Uh, that's going to be an advantage over American Indians. And because old world people live by uh, those animals, they're going to share diseases with those animals. So if you think about, we had swine flu not long ago, bird flu not long ago, there's a fear of those. Uh, those are diseases that pass from one species to another. People in Europe are going to start getting those sooner because they're going to have more domesticated animals. Because again, New World people killed their uh, a lot of their large animals off, and that's going to be a problem for Old World people, people in the Eastern Hemisphere, at first. Because hey, I'm dying a lot of these uh, uh, diseases pass between animals, but over time they're they're going to develop immunities to them. 
uh, because the American Indians, with these first generations killing off a lot of these animals that could later be domesticated, they're not going to have that opportunity. And as we're going to see when Europeans come over with diseases that American Indians have never been exposed to because they don't have as many domesticated animals, that's going to be a problem. All right, and again, it, that's one of the problems uh, with this megafauna extinction. Other problem is what do we do now that these easy food sources are gone? Well, humans are basically going to have to learn how to adapt. Uh, they're going to start having to learn to um, uh, figure out other ways to uh, kill off these large uh, animals. So they'll come up with things like uh, buffalo. Buffalo are actually the largest land animal in Texas and actually in all of North America to survive this megafauna extinction. It's kind of unclear why buffalo uh, are the largest land animal. We think it's because they're naturally skittish animals. Uh, they saw these humans come in, even though they're smaller than them, uh, the buffalo run away, they end up surviving. So that's the largest land animal around, but they're hard to hunt. You, you got to get um, uh, close to them uh, in order to hunt. Or, you know, if they see you, they're going to run away. Well, humans will come up with things like, you know, uh, having to develop ways to sneak up to the buffalo to kill them. Uh, in this depiction, this one is a, a, a horrible way to hunt buffalo. I think these uh, American Indians are dressed like uh, wolves. Buffalo are scared of wolves as well, guys. This is a horrible costume, and so they're trying to sneak up to kill these guys. This dude sees what's going on. He's like, you idiots, uh, I know uh, what, you, what you guys are doing. And by the way, again, I'm scared of wolves just as much as I'm scared of humans. Uh, so he's probably telling his buddies they're running off before these guys get any food. But again, you come up with creative methods to start uh, killing these guys, maybe drive them off cliffs, scare them intentionally, drive them off a cliff, and get the uh, food when they're driven off the cliff. Um, if you can't get close to buffalo, and it's not just buffalo, deer, rabbits, these other small game that don't just sit there like the megafauna and let you kill them, uh, you got to find maybe ways to attack them from a uh, further distance. Uh, so what this guy has here, he has something called an atlatl. This is a... Uh, it's basically a large, uh, it's not just a spear, but it's a, see the stick right here? This is, uh, it's almost like an adding an extra joint to your arm. You stick the steer in this little uh, stick, and then you can chunk it further distance. So this guy's got it, he's chunked his. The spear goes a lot further, a lot faster uh, than it would if thrown by hand. So you can hit a buffalo from 20 yards, uh, 30 yards, something like that. Whereas if you just thrown it by hand, you know, maybe 15 yards, and it, you know, it's not going to kill a buffalo a lot of the times. Uh, so humans will develop that. We don't know where they came up with it, probably outside of Texas and arrived in Texas uh, later on. Uh, bow and arrow, that's going to come along, uh, and, and people of Texas will uh, adopt it to start sm hunting some of this smaller game. Uh, people of Texas will start coming up with methods to, you know, uh, set intentional grass fires. I, meant, uh, I mentioned before, if uh, possible environmental effects. Well, people of Texas, these hunter-gatherers, uh, sometimes will set grass fire to herd buffalo where they want them uh, and then start hunting them easier that way or, you know, chase deer out of uh, forest by setting the forest on fire. Or, you know, um, some people argue that uh, buffalo, uh, Indians never wanted to domesticate buffalo because they didn't have to. All you have to do is just set these seasonal fires, burn down the old grass, the buffalo have a good supply of the fresh young grass which they like to eat and then um, uh, you can just get as, meat, as, as much meat as you want from them. Again, there's that theory that uh, so much of this seasonal burning would happen to, uh, uh, to promote buffalo growth. The, the Texas Plains, some people argue that it was, used to be covered in, in these smaller trees, but uh, Indians burned it so much that a lot of these, these trees uh, went extinct. And again, one of these, the things that I want to hammer home here is that you know, the sort of crying Indian you see on the beach, you know, is worried about trash, something like that. I, 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 that's silly. Again, you know, people are people. We're going to do uh, what's best for us and our kids. And, and uh, for American Indians, you know, they're not living one with the land. They're trying to use the land to their advantage, and that included uh, uh, burning it for uh, uh, to, to promote buffalo growth by getting these new grasses to replace old grasses. So you come up with these new methods to... Uh, to adapt to this this life without megafauna, all right? So from about um, uh, megafauna go extinct, you know, let's go 13,000 years ago or so, uh, up until about 2000 BC, so about 4,000 years ago, 
uh, humans in Texas are going to be living like this, hunter-gatherers, things like that. Well, some humans are going to adapt differently to uh, life without this megafauna animals. He's easy to hunt animals. Um, we're going to see humans in two areas in the Americas, um, Mesoamerica and the Andes, they're going to start developing agriculture. And eventually this agriculture is going to reach Texas. All right? So about 10,000 years ago, 8,000 BC, we don't know exact timeline here. And we don't know exactly how this happens, again, because there's no written records. But what we think is a group of hunter-gatherers here or down here, by this point, the megafauna are all extinct uh, throughout the Americas. We think of groups here, they're sitting here on a seasonal migration, moving from one place to another, uh, hunting the, the remaining small animals. Somebody realizes, and we think this happens independently in both of these places, that, hey, you know, last time when we were in this area, uh, we were here last year moving around chasing these uh, animals. Remember we ate those berries, there's the natural berries, and somebody realizes, yeah, you know, maybe talking to their friend and the, the hunter-gatherer tribe, and they, their friend says, yeah, I remember there. And then after we ate them, I remember these little tiny, you know, brown things, let's call them seeds. You know, they would come out when we went to the bathroom, went to the bathroom over in this spot, you know, over there. And the other guys are going to look and maybe another member of the tribe and say, hey, you know what's funny is that we went to the bathroom. There's more berry bushes growing there. And the other guy's going to say, well, do you think it was because of planting these seeds? Again, this is not exactly how it happened. Nobody knows how it happened. We think somebody makes this observation. And then one of these tribes says, uh, remember the tribe said, well, let's do an experiment. Let's, you know, stick some of these seeds in our poop and see if next year uh, we have um, uh, bushes growing up. Well, sure enough, next thing, it, it, next year comes around. Uh, there's bushes growing up. Well, maybe this group decides, let's stay here two more days and let's plant a couple more seeds. So next uh, next year comes around, we'll have more berries to eat because we really like those berries. And let's, maybe let's say, um, you know, uh, this, this group still goes around for 360 days of the year, uh, chasing animals, getting plants from other places. But they spend this five days at this berry place planting these seeds. Well, you know, let's say a generation passes, maybe somebody down the road, uh, you know, the kids, the grandkids uh, says, you know what, these berries, they are being eaten by these insects. What if we stay here an extra couple days, pick off the eggs, uh, insect eggs from these bushes, I bet we'll have more berries. So instead of staying there 360 day, days a year, now they stay there, or I'm sorry, uh, staying there five days, now they stay there 10 days picking off these uh, insect dates. Again, not exactly how it happened, but something like this. Now they're still mostly hunter-gatherers, but they're just spending a little bit more time in this one area. Well, let's say 100 years past, somebody says, you know what, um, every time we plant these seeds, uh, mice eat the seeds. So what if we spend our time uh, an extra week here and we dig little channels and we plant the seeds two inches deeper. The mice won't eat the seeds, won't dig them up. So now they spend an extra two weeks there. Now at this point they're you know, still 11 months hunter-gatherers, but they're in one place for a month. Then maybe, again, this doesn't happen within a generation, happens over hundreds and thousands of years. Uh, maybe you know, 150 years from then, somebody says, hey, what if we stay here an extra month and I, I noticed that years where it doesn't rain, we don't get as many uh, berries. Why don't we just dig a channel from the nearby creek and have it flood the berries so they get enough uh, water? So now they're spending, let's say, three quarters of their time at these berry bushes. Maybe somebody else says, well, you know, what about this other plant over here? Let's start planting this alongside the berry bushes. We like to eat this as well. So now they spend more time. What begins in about you know, 8,000 BC, is this process going to be called the agricultural revolution, okay? This isn't something, again, that happens overnight. It's not something that people think about. It's just something that once people start planting food, it sort of grabs you, and before you know it, you're going to have a uh, society that used to be hunter-gatherers. It used to be uh, 365 days a year moving around, hunting small animals, you know, gathering small plants. Now you're planting food, Okay. In some ways, this is going to be good. As we're going to talk about some ways, this is going to be bad. But one of the ways agriculture is going to be good is these first humans will have more calories 
than uh, of previous groups. Okay, so if you're agricultural, you plant your food, you simply can get more calories than you can chasing animals around. That ex uh, chasing animals around expends a lot, a lot of calories. You know, again, uh, food's going to be inconsistent. You know, sometimes years are dry. Uh, animals, you know, not enough vegetation for animals. Maybe you'll start to starve. But if you're agricultural, you know, calories aren't always consistent because there's going to be years of drought. But if you use the same amount of effort to plant crops as you do hunt, you're going to get more calories uh, than you would hunting and gathering. And what this is going to mean is that you can have the work of a couple people provide for everybody. Um, so in a hunter-gatherer tribe, everybody is on the search for calories. It's uh, usually hunter-gatherer groups, dozen people, maybe two dozen people. All of their energy, or just, just about all their energy, is devoted towards, towards searching for food. That's not the case with agricultural societies. In agricultural societies, you can have a small percentage of people provide the food for everybody. So in the United States today, it's something like 2% of people, uh, farmers, um, provide the food for 98% of the people. Now, it wasn't anywhere near that uh, when agriculture first started taking hold in, in American Indian societies. Uh, but it is going to free up labor for other purposes, okay? Hunter-gatherers really can't do anything. They can't, they can't devote uh, a lot of time to creating music, art, anything like that because they're constantly searching for food. But if you have, again, early agricultural societies, let, let's, uh, let's say these three people here, they start playing the food. They, through their labor, can provide for everybody in the tribe, okay? So uh, hunter-gatherers, all these people be working. Now we've only got three people uh, providing for food enough for everybody. So what these that means is that the rest of these people can now de do things you can't do as hunter-gatherers, and we can put them to work uh, doing other things, okay? So let's say this person right here, um, hunter-gatherer tribe, again, they'd be searching for food, but now they don't have to because these people are providing for them. How can we put this guy to work? Well, what you can do is um, oh, uh, you can put them to work on, say, developing new technology. So maybe this person, uh, what they do is they take all the berries at the end of the year or whatever type of plants are growing, and um, they're just going to pick out the ones that are the biggest, the ones that taste the best. And what they'll do is, you know, maybe plant those uh, uh, the next year, have these guys plant those ones, which means that next year's crop of berries or whatever is going to be more, have more calories, have more nutrition. Uh, and so now you can maybe just have two people working for the rest of these people. So maybe you have somebody uh, developing, uh, uh, you know, uh, breeding uh, different strains of, of plants. And by the way, this is something that you're going to see in Mesoamerica, something that's going to be important to what we're going to talk about in Texas. Uh, Indians in Mesoamerica, they actually take a grass that you can barely get any calories out of called teosinte, and they're going to start breeding this thing, taking the, the uh, bigger kernels, until uh, after uh, hundreds of years, they get something that resembles modern day corn. That was almost inedible until you started seeing this crossbreeding. Maybe this guy, by the way, also starts uh, domesticating some animals. In the Americas, we don't have nearly as many domesticated animals because of the mega megafauna extinction, but you do have things like domesticated turkeys, and in uh, South America, you have domesticated llamas, stuff like that. Maybe this is uh, guinea pigs. Maybe these are additional food sources. All right, so we got this guy working on uh, these different food sources. And now we're getting so many calories, the population starts growing. Now we're beyond just a couple dozen people. Maybe we have our first towns or cities. You start to see that when you get agriculture. Again, hunter-gatherers, just a couple dozen people at most. But you start to see in Mesoamerica and the Andes, towns of hundreds, towns of thousands of people, okay? When this starts to happen, you're going to start to see social stratification. Well, if you want these three guys working... They're, you know, doing stuff that sucks. Working uh, agriculture is, uh, is, especially without machines we have today, it's tough work. But these guys are needed to get these rest of these guys food. So to keep them working, you got to have a boss. So we start to see our first chiefs uh, in hunter-gatherer societies. You kind of have a leader, but it would actually be very democratic, where you know everybody contributed to the decision-making process. Well, if you got some people working doing the bad jobs, you got to kind of have another person on top to say, 
this is why you need to do the work. You know, uh, you guys do this. You work on uh, domesticated animals. You work on this. You work on this. You need to have diversification of labor. And you also start to see governments, okay, complex governments. So this guy, uh, he appoints somebody to watch over the workers to make sure they keep working. He's the one making decisions. And as we're going to talk about, that leads to, to class structure. We'll get to that more in a second. So um, we start to see government form. We also start to see art, complex art. We had, you know, simple hand painting, stuff like that. But when you start to get this guy, let's say, devoted entirely to uh, – art, you're going to start to see advanced pottery, maybe complex music. You're also going to start to see advanced religion. So hunter-gatherers, they had simple explanations, but you'll start to see, you know, multiple gods, sometimes in the case of Mesoamerican groups, hundreds of gods, and these gods are sort of meant to explain uh, different processes. You don't have the complex religions in hunter-gatherer societies. Uh, you start to see, again, maybe somebody developing better technology. This guy's our inventor, comes up with a better uh, you know, gardening implements to make the planting crops easier. Maybe he comes up with um, uh, you know, writing, which is what some we see in Mesoamerica. Maybe he comes up with um, you know, uh, better boats to supplement their diet through um, uh, fishing. And, and by the way, a lot of these hunt, uh, sorry, agricultural societies, they're not going to completely give up their, their hunting because – Again, they don't have the animals like the cows and the pigs uh, because, again, their ancestors uh, drove them to extinction. So we will still see some hunters being sent out. Maybe one of these guys is sent out to provide the protein. Maybe this guy invents a, a boat that's going to allow these guys to better fish to allow them to get their protein needs that way. Again, you can't have inventors. We have inventors today because we have uh, our farmers providing the rest of our food. All right, so we start to see complex religion, start to see... Uh, a big cities develop. Maybe this guy over here, maybe he becomes military, all right? Maybe we start to run out of land, send this guy over here to the, uh, uh, this group over here who's also starting to pick up on our agriculture. They're starting to grow food as well. Well, let's get this guy. He trains to become military. We send him out to kill that group. Uh, then we either take them over, make, make them provide for us, or we just you know take over their land and we start to get more calories for our people by farming their land. So you start seeing military uh, come out with these more uh, complex societies and more agricultural societies. So you start to see these things happen uh, with agricultural societies, and pretty soon you're going to have you know cities again develop. You're going to have uh, large population centers, and again this begins in Mesoamerica in the Andes. Well, with this, again, this uh, agriculture, you will start to see some negatives. Like, again, if you have people telling other people they got to work, you're going to have class. So you're going to have people at the bottom that are laborers, get somebody at top that's the boss. He's not going to have to work as hard. Uh, you're going to have, you know, maybe shamans, uh, you know, um, uh, sort of under the boss. Uh, sometimes they are the boss, actually, in a lot of these societies. Uh, and they're going to have more than people at the bottom. Again, people at the bottom, agriculture is a lot of hard work, so backs are going to get uh, bent over. Human bodies made to, to hunt, not really to, to uh, plant crops. So you got to sort of force them to work. You're going to uh, start having wars. Um, again, as agriculture starts to spread, so one group will see another group do it, see their population growing. Maybe I should do that. You now have competition for resources. Uh, there's some argument about whether there's more death in hunter-gatherer societies versus agricultural societies. Um, you know, probably more death in hunter-gatherer societies, but the scale's bigger when you get to these um, agricultural societies. So as the populations get larger, wars become more deadly simply because there's more people. Uh, one thing I should point out, as agriculture starts to spread, there's not going to be... Uh, um, uh, Hunter-gatherers aren't going to immediately go away because, as we'll talk about, not everywhere is good for growing crops. So some of these agricultural societies will have hunter-gatherers occasionally stealing their stuff. Another problem for uh, agricultural societies is you start to see that nutrition isn't going to be great. So you get more calories, and you're actually one of the good things about over hunter-gatherers is you can store a lot of these calories. Corn, you can dry corn, you can stick it in a uh, storage place. And in years where it doesn't rain, um, you know, you have a store of corn. So you're going to survive those winters where if a hunter-gatherer society, there's a drought, animals die, they're going to die. Uh, these guys can store uh, food for years where there's uh, shortages. So um, that's an advantage of, of agricultural societies. 
But there is a problem when you start living off only a couple crops. So as we'll talk about, corn, beans, and squash are a big uh, a player in the American agricultural societies. Those are great. They provide protein. They provide carbohydrates. They provide fat. But there are certain nutrients they don't provide. Uh, and in a lot of these societies, they are going to be a little light on protein because, um, you know, hunter-gatherers, they, they just simply uh, get more of this these game. And this means that you're going to start to see things like uh, uh, malnutrition, which is weird because you think more calories, more nutrition. That's not the case. Hunter-gatherers, again, when they do have food, when they don't, they're in trouble. When they do, they're getting something like 70 different sources of food. So they're eating grubs, they're eating leaves, they're eating you know, wild strawberries, they're eating fish, they're eating whatever. So they have a diverse diet. A lot of these agricultural societies, they only have three main crops. And a lot of times those aren't going to provide for their calorie needs. So that's going to be a problem for these groups. Uh, agricultural societies, you see osteoporosis, you see tooth decay. So one of the ways we know how uh, and when a society d develops agriculture is because uh, their teeth start rotting. So, you know, archaeologists, one of the first things they look up when they uh, dig up a skeleton is to see how much their tooth teeth are rotting. Human teeth were made for hunting and gathering occasional fruit, mostly animal uh, protein and fat. Uh, but you start introducing more carbohydrates, you see tooth decay. So uh, dentists, uh, if evolution had caught up, dentists wouldn't be necessary, but you know, because uh, we got more sugar than we used to have, uh, dentists are necessary. So it's becoming agriculture leads to some positives, but it's it's also got its negatives. Now, again, we're not going to get to talk about this much, but sports, you can't have complex sports if you're constantly searching for food for hunter-gatherers. So we will see American Indian societies develop sports for the first time. Uh, and we are going to see in certain areas, and the area we're going to talk about later, uh, Mesoamerica, this is where agriculture, one of the places agriculture starts. And this is going to be where you're going to see the highly advanced society. So this is a uh, mural of the Aztecs. So it gets to the point where in, in uh, Mesoamerica, things become so complex that um, Indians will have these uh, uh, large cities. This, this Tenochtitlan, which we're going to talk about, 200,000 people uh, in it. And again, you're going to have pottery, you're going to have cotton clothing, you're going to have gold, silver, jewelry. Um, you know, uh, plumbing. You're going to have stuff like that that you, you can't get close to having if you're a hunter-gatherer society. Another picture is Note Sheet Line, which we'll talk about soon. So all this agricultural revolution, again, it begins Andes, Mesoamerica, and it's going to start spreading from there. So 10,000 years ago, it's going to start spreading north, spreading north uh, from 10,000 years ago, but it's not going to be, it's going to take uh, 6,000 years, so from 8,000 B.C. Uh, until, um, until 2,000 B.C. for it to get from here up to uh, northern part of Mexico, what's today Texas, 2,000 years. Why would it take so long to go uh, that distance? Well, what we think is that you know, first of all, a lot of hunter-gatherer societies, it, it just, uh, they're a little uh, hesitant to uh, adopt this, this stuff in the first place. It kind of looks weird, but, you know, again, if you see that your enemy's population growing, you might, you might start adopting it. Um, but we think that the main reason is that here in uh, northern Mexico, the, the land is simply not good for growing agriculture. It's just bad. Like it's, uh, you try to plant food here today, even with modern technology, it's kind of tough to grow food in northern Mexico. So what we think is that people see down in Mesoamerica, they're growing food, try to grow food up here, but it doesn't take, you know, like this just doesn't grow food. So I'm going to continue to be a hunter gatherer. So we'll actually see people uh, here in, in northern Mexico, when Europeans arrive, they're still going to be hunter-gatherers because food doesn't grow. So we, we see a couple people, though, start adopting agriculture here, and it starts creeping its way, but because, it, you know, the harshness of the land is very, very slow. Not every, Again, if it doesn't grow perfectly, you, you're, you're you know, maybe sticking with hunting, get, hunting and gathering. So it's a slow process. So it actually takes about 6,000 years. And what we think is that it sort of creeps its way up in about 2000 BC or so, uh, uh, we see it start getting up here into Texas. So um, uh, right around here uh, today, what's today, Presidio, we think right around this area might even be the first place in, in uh, north of Mexico that has agriculture. And it's going to start spreading north from there. It's going to spread up here 
uh, into, again, far west Texas and then into New Mexico. And then we're going to start seeing once agriculture gets up uh, here, again, far west Texas and then into uh, New Mexico, uh, some of these more complex civilizations start to develop, agricultural civilizations, that they couldn't have developed without agriculture. So we're going to talk about that next time.